Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. I am currently up here on Pikes Peak. Today, the most beautiful place in the world. Perhaps you can guess at the sappy metric by which I determine that every day. But uh, it is an objective metric, I believe. Um, and I thought I would offer a few more remarks on a subject I started talking about in late 2022, which is the trilogy called The Hammer and the Cross by Harry Harrison and or Tom Shippey going under the pseudonym John Holm. And the reason I thought about it was I started rereading the book again. I had paused after making that first video because uh, Tom Shippey reached out to me and we are going to interview him on my Patreon channel on Zoom. My Patreon supporters will join me and uh, have the opportunity to ask some questions just like my other Patreon interviews you've seen on this channel perhaps. Uh, really looking forward to that. We'll find out from him maybe a little bit more about you know, the, the rumors that he's sort of the, the the ghost writer of it or how exactly this all this all worked out. I just thought I would offer a few more remarks about uh, some other parts of the middle of the book. I'm not going to do a blow by blow of this book, though. start this video by thanking my Patreon supporters who helped make it possible for me to make a living teaching the subjects of my expertise in the world's most beautiful places. And uh, to everyone who buys my books, thank you so much. Yeah, if you want to blow by blow of books, I've got to recommend my good friend uh, Connor Lestoka and Mike Nelson's podcast, 372 Pages Will Never Get Back. Mike Nelson, of course, Mystery Science Theater 3000 fame. They uh, basically do the Mystery Science Theater 3000 version of bad books. They read through them blow by blow and get their commentary. It's great. Also, um, I am in another, or my iPhone is in another phase where it accepts no microphone under the sun. So if the audio is bad because I live in a windy place, sue me. These videos are free. All right, but uh, so when we left off in uh, my previous video about the hammer and the cross, the, uh, the Norse raiders under the Ragnar sons, who of course are treated in several different sources of medieval literature in Old Icelandic, the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, and then the actually fairly different short story, Thalthor, of the Ragnar's sons, Ragnar Sona Thaltor. Um, to use modern Icelandic in a video where it doesn't really matter, just so people don't get on me as much. Um, the Ragnar sons have led their, their great army into Eastern England and have uh, more or less successfully taken over in East Anglia and are uh, preparing their campaign against Northumbria. Now, Chev, our English semi-thrall, semi-slave. Um, he's never had the collar around his neck, which is treated always in the story as being a big symbolic um, thing about slaves, which it probably was for owners who could afford the collars. Um, but just because he's, he's, he's some complicated genealogy where he's like the, the sort of an, a semi-acknowledged bastard son of a, of a freeman. He uh, knows that his love, uh, Godiva, which uh, I'm saying it's sort of more like the old English name. Of course, it looks a lot like later English Godiva, but Godiva, something like that in old English. She's been captured, and we read that she is presented to uh, Ivar the Boneless by the, uh, uh, the Viking who was captured her. And everyone goes silent because it's apparently... Um, there's apparently something wrong with presenting captured women to Ivar the Boneless, and it's sort of hinted that there's something dark about him. And um, as the story goes on, we actually have a fair number of hints that the reason that he's called Ivar the Boneless is that he is impotent. Um, 
And in fact, that may sound like a real 20th or 21st century explanation for that nickname or a real English speaking explanation for that nickname, but um, bone or bane, which also means leg, um, has the same sort of slingy second meaning in Old Norse as in English. And so it could in fact mean that. And in Ragnarsson Thautr, uh, one of the old Icelandic sources about these very men, that is exactly what it means. Um, now in the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, which I translated as part of my Saga of the Volsungs book, because it's sort of a fanfic sequel to it, um, he's treated as literally not having bones, as being, you know, Mr. Stretch or something, but um, the more prosaic explanation in Ragnar uh is surprising, but it is what's, what's used here. Um, long story short, without details that I have much to comment about, Chef manages to uh, get her out of the Viking camp when the English counterstrike against the Vikings. He sort of can't decide what side he's on because he's been adopted at this point by Thorvin, which means Thor's friend. Uh, not a name that's actually very common, but very appropriate to this character because he is a dedicated priest of the Way, which I suppose in Old Norse be Vegrin. Um, this is uh, presented as kind of a like reform Alsatru, right, in, in the Viking Age. These are guys who have a more structured view of uh, the gods. They're presented as being the uh, the composers and the keepers of the Eddic poems, whereas the Skaldic poetic tradition, which of course praises kings and, and warriors and, and whatever, is written as being kind of more the, the uh, more, uh, just to use a simple term, you know, barbarian-like, uh, Vikings uh, art form, which is interesting because scholarly poetry is actually more complicated, but you know, it's a fun little little spin on the story. So when you see an Eddic poem like Bolasbal or Halvamal quoted in The Hammer and the Cross, it's typically one of the Waymen quoting it. When you see a Skaldic poem quoted, it's typically one of the, the other guys. But Thorvin thinks that Shev has something special about him because his name happens to be the English form of um, the name that you see, well, I mean, you see it actually in English in, in Beowulf, Shield Shaving, the founder of the uh, Danish royal dynasty there. Um, although it's been given to him as a dog's name, as an insult, uh, there's this notion that things that are sort of accidentally done in accordance with fate have a more fateful echo, right? That's that's more in accord with, with uh, the dictates of weird or or that are from an old Norse perspective. Um, so there's a prophecy that there's one who will come from the north and he comes from Norfolk and says he's from the north when he first meets them uh, with a king's name or something like that. So he thinks maybe Shev has something special about him. And indeed, Shev does. I'll give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Grimfrost to come back and talk a little bit more about some of the other stuff in the middle of this book. So Shev learns from Thorvin, the wayman priest of Thor, and his friend um, who has had the collar around his neck and has a very definite dog's name, Hund, which just means dog, uh, apprentices to the priest of Idun. Whether there was actually a priesthood of Idun is hard to say, but she's presented as a healing figure here, which is kind of a fun notion, right? She's the one who keeps the apples that keep the gods young. So if there's a healing figure in Norse myth, I suppose it could be her. Um, the two of them apprentice these different guys in the Viking camp, and they uh, proceed, as I said, during the, the battle where the English come and counter-strike against the Vikings, they get Gojiva out. But Gojiva has misinterpreted Ivar's reluctance to touch her as being, you know, gentlemanliness, when in fact he's waiting for the his violent psychopathic tendencies to come on that he has. But anyway, she comes between the sword of the English king and uh, and Ivar and spares him. None of this is really part of the story in uh, any of the sagas or in Saxo's version of this in uh, his uh, Latin language work, The History of the Danes, Gustav Norum, but 
it's it's a fun spin on the history with this, the legend there. Now Shev is punished for uh, taking Gojiva out of the camp, and uh, he's also assisted some of the English slaves that had been captured in getting out. Although I don't think that the uh, most of the Norsemen know that, but they do know that he was there with Gojiva. Uh, but they also know that he and she helped prevent Ivar from dying. So it's kind of this counterbalance. He's stolen the, uh, you know, quote unquote, stolen the woman, but also saved Ivar's life. So they have a, a thing, right, a council meeting of the whole army where we see uh, how, just how well Tom Shippey, and I'm, I'm going to credit Tom Shippey for this, because I think it, it is a credit to him, how well he understands and presents this culture and how important it is, the sort of negotiations around Drengskapr, right, the notions of manliness, right, and part of the notion of manliness is, is that, that bravado, that show, right, and that willingness to seem fair in one's dealings with others. And we see uh, also, I, I think this shows really good psychology, this notion that, you know, these war camps, they get bored and they want to see a good show. So when Chev is brought up for sort of quote unquote trial before this thing, um, you know, everybody's stretching out their, their speeches that they could just behead him as Ivar wants to, or, you know, mutilate him worse than that. But it's like, well, that's not so satisfying. It's not such an interesting answer. It's also not an interesting answer to just let him go because he's done some harm to the, to the Viking camp. So they wind up taking one of his eyes out. A horrible punishment, but of course, less than death, um, as Habermal itself mentions, right? Uh, better blind than a corpse. Um, this, of course, makes him more like Odin, and so some of the waymen begin to suspect that he is um, somehow connected to Odin, and he has dreams in which he encounters Odin, but he suspects that he is not, in fact, being favored by Odin, but being favored by someone else. And spoiler alert, I mean, if you read this book, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. The fact that the book is broken up into three sections, Thrall, Karl, Jarl, uh, slave or peasant, freeman, nobleman, shows you the progression that he's going to take and also hints at who his actual uh, divine patron is. Now, Chev joins the Viking army um, alongside his friend from Hologaland, which if you've read the sagas of um, the Hrafnis, the folk, so that includes Arrow Odd Saga, uh, really wonderfully weird mythical heroic sagas. That's a uh, location in northern Norway that, that those heroes are from, and uh, which we'll return to in the second book in this trilogy with uh, the hero from that land, uh, Viga Brander, uh, Killer Brand, who um, is just one of the best sort of scripted characters in this, right? He's always talking about the Rengskapur, um, always talking about, you know, how to put on the right show, um, and he's also obsessed with, um, and they do use the Norse word for this, fie, money, property, livestock, right, all of those things together. It's what he's out there for, not for this, you know, not, not, not to do harm, but to get rich and go back home rich. And because when Chef is imprisoned, uh, after his, um, his, his breakout into, I mean, in prison, he's, he's kept under guard. Alongside the English king who has been captured, he hears from the English king the location of the uh, East Anglian king's great hoard in a burial mound from uh, pagan times, when the English were pagan. And I'll return to um, some of the fun details that are in that in the next video in this Hammer and the Cross series, which will be after we've had a great chance to talk to Tom Shippey himself. So if you're interested in that, you want to support the channel, it's much appreciated. Come on by patreon.com slash Norse by Southwest, Norse by SW. Sign up and come to this live interview with Tom Shippey and you might have a chance to ask him your question about the Tolkien studies, medieval studies, his new Beowulf book, Hammer and the Cross, who knows. For now, from currently the most beautiful place in the world, beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the very best.